Hello and welcome to CSE 293 Agile Hardware Design. I am the instructor, Professor Scott Beamer. Uh, today uh, we are recording directly this call, but in the future we will have a such a setup such that we can have myself record it because these recordings we put on the public internet. However, you students will be uh, kept anonymous in from that. So, uh, what's going on today? Well, let's talk about that. So we're of course, introduce this course. And to do that, we're going to do our best to motivate why we're doing this, as well as pitch this whole talk of why we're talking about agile design, why is it so important, what's so cool about it. And then we'll talk about the typical kind of course details. OK, so uh, you know, as we're all well aware, there are many types of electronics in the world these days, right? You know, maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago, you know, maybe there was a far uh, fewer them, less diversity, less chips, but now it's just a plethora everywhere, right? It's not just smartphones in our pockets or, you know, computers in a data center, it's Internet of Things, it's high performance embedded all around us. You know, the number of chips that are in a car we get into every day just keeps going up and up and up. As a result, there's just tons of electronic design going on all around us. So that's perhaps maybe good for us if we're hoping to get employment in that sector. So what, what's, what's the problem? Well, uh, the problem is that uh, we're running the various challenges, right? And so there's a number of things kind of simultaneously happening at the same time, right? Uh, the one you may often hear us talk about as architects is this notion of Moore's law. That is the empirical observation that the number of transistors you can economically produce keeps increasing exponentially over time. Uh, that's slowing down, right? And that, that's a little worrisome because often how we're able to produce new products that have new capabilities is by somehow harnessing those additional transistors to do more things, right? And if instead we're given the same transistor budget we had before, we need to be a lot more clever how we use them in order to ensure that uh, we don't, uh, you know, deliver something new. Uh, but whether Moore's law slows down, is slowing down, will never slow down. People obviously will debate all these kind of things. What is undeniable is that transistor energy efficiency has long since uh, stopped scaling at the rate we need to. So it does get a little better. We get smaller, already a little better, but not enough better. This is often referred to as Denard scaling. But the result is that uh, even if you get more transistors, they aren't enough more efficient to justify you can turn them all on. So be very careful what you use. And so the way we've been solving this as architects is in something called specialization. That is, we will specialize hardware, specialized computers to solve just the specific problem we want to solve. And by doing so, uh, we can get better efficiency. Now, that would be great, except for as an uh, additional problem, right? Additional problem is that we go to these really, really small transistor sizes, you know, types of sizes that are causing issues for us continuing Moore's law. Uh, it gets extremely expensive to design these chips, right? Uh, it's the design cost, the verification cost, the manufacturing cost, the fixed cost of manufacturing, as well as the, uh, you know, uh, per, per product cost. They're all adding up. It's extremely expensive to design a chip in the most advanced process, right? And so, wait a second. On the one hand, we want uh, a lot of designs. We want to handle a lot of different product categories. We want a lot of different designs have specialized capabilities for all those different uh, scenarios. And then on the other hand, we're saying, wait a second. Uh, each design then costs more to make. And that's a real problem, right? Because if it costs a lot to make a design, in order to make the whole process worthwhile, you need to have a large market justify that engineering cost to design it, right? And unfortunately, if there's just uh, you know not a large enough market, you can't justify it. And so wait a second, we have a huge demand for more designs, but they're more expensive. And so this is really kind of a, a problem, right? Uh, yes, uh, but fortunately, I mean, this is a, you know, industry-wide thing, field-wide thing, people are aware of this and we're on it. And the solution isn't multifaceted, right? But the biggest one is we need to figure out a way to get these design costs under control, right? Um, you know, we can make hopefully better transistors, you can make nice designs, but if we don't use design costs under control, we're not gonna produce all these designs we need for all different product categories. We're not gonna produce all these designs in order to make the specialized things we need to have a, a great energy efficiency for certain applications. That's the most important thing. But what's exciting about this is these challenges are creating a sea of change in the field. And so even just a very recent Turing Award lecture, I believe in 2018, I want to say, referred to this as actually the golden age of computer architecture. And the reason why is that everything is so much in flux, it's so much up for grabs, there's a lot of change happening. And in order to get out of this, we're really going to have a lot of new designs created and a lot of new things deployed. And that's really exciting. So uh, to get into the in mentality of this course, I'm going to give you a taste of two different philosophies here, right? So uh, on the one hand, consider the waterfall, right? Where uh, this is the kind of mentality where you want things to be done 
very carefully and you want to be kind of planning in advance. And this is kind of, we think of, think of proper engineering, right? We're saying, oh, well, you know, I don't just tack something together. No, 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 I'm going to, you know, be very deliberate and have a plan and I'm going to have design docs and execute the plan and then it's going to go all according to plan, right? And so this is something we see a lot of other engineering fields do. And we as computer scientists, you know, we want to be engineers, we want to take it seriously. So we eagerly embody this, right? Uh, and so you can imagine maybe, for example, you're some engineer trying to build a dam. And okay, well, if you're going to build something like the Hoover Dam, let's set a picture down below, you really want to make sure you get it right, right? You want to make sure this dam is not going to crumble and dump a bunch of water downstream. Uh, and if you're going to pour, you know, this the millions and millions of, uh, you know, uh, amounts of concrete, you need to make sure you get that right, right? So you're going to really plan the heck out of it. You're going to very carefully build your molds. You're going to plan this all out and you're going to do it because you only want to pour this concrete once. Because once you kind of poured concrete, you know, it's, it's set, right? You don't want to mess with that. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's perhaps an agile philosophy, right? And that is this mentality, you know what? I can't know the perfect design in advance. How could I possibly know that before I started, right? So I need to instead embrace the notion of to kind of constantly reassess and adapt. And as an example, you maybe imagine you're a competitive athlete, right? Um, and you can do everything you can to prepare, right? You can try and get yourself in really good shape. You can do practice. You can train maybe teammates if it's a team sport. But at the end of the day, when it comes to competition, you can't control everything, right? You don't know what your opponent's going to do. You know, perhaps other things can happen. So you need to be ready to adapt and adjust on the fly, right? And so these are kind of two, uh, you know, philosophies here. I'm kind of, you know, making exaggerated caricatures of the two. I think it does kind of still flavor our mentality for the rest of this conversation, though. Okay, so uh, if you look at these two different philosophies, let's perhaps make this more concrete and think more about hardware design. And as I said before, these are kind of, you know, exaggerated caricatures, right? And they aren't necessarily 100% we see everything to detail, but it gives you the sense, right? So in the waterfall style of the hardware design, you can do every phase very carefully, right? You're gonna make a design. You're gonna figure out a block diagram. You're gonna figure out each of those blocks. You're gonna specify very carefully what they're gonna do. Okay, and if this block does this thing with this way and follows this protocol in this way, that's what it needs to do, right? And so then you hand that off to some team, you know, here's design doc, here's specifications. You need to build me a block that, you know, does X, Y, and Z, has interface A, B, and C, and meets the following area and uh, energy and you know, timing budgets. And they go off and build that. And then you know, everyone goes off and builds their blocks. And as long as everyone you know, builds their block according to specification, as long as the original specification was good, then you put them all together and you should have a done system, right? Um, and OK, when we put them together, you can already see maybe some challenges, right? For example, you put them together, even though maybe everyone kept their budget, perhaps you know, maybe when you, after you integrate, you realize, oh, shoot. Uh, maybe we need to do a little more to get on the budget, right? Or maybe it's not quite fast enough, not quite small enough, whatever. And even still, once you put them all together, you know, you test them all individually with unit tests, you'll still need to test them all together and see how that goes, right? By contrast, uh, an agile approach will um, kind of take this more iterative uh, revision style mentality, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, we're going to start this design. And as soon as we possibly can, we're going to get the minimum viable thing working with that minimum viable thing that's working, then we're gonna go ahead and continually improve it, right? And so that minimum viable thing may not have all functionality we're responsible for, but the whole point is like the whole thing working, right? We wanna see the entire system end to end, how it's gonna look and we can go ahead and add more functionality and we can go ahead and you know optimize, make it more efficient. But the goal is we're kind of continually doing this, right? So you can keep going around uh, this metaphorical loop here over and over again, kind of designing, implementing, optimizing, verifying, et cetera. And you do this enough times until you get a result you're satisfied with. And so these are kind of two different mentalities and you're kind of made a little more concrete for hardware. Let's kind of maybe probe a little bit into why this might uh, make sense or sorry, oops, I'm already doing this stuff. Okay, so what makes Agile possible, right? Cause I mean, perhaps at this point it's not clear what the trade-offs are, what the benefits are, but let's think about why is Agile worthwhile, right? Well, the point of Agile is that we need to recognize that the end goal, and especially the path to it, really may be hard to know in advance. And for some things, maybe it's pretty clear, like, okay, I need to build a dam. It needs to hold all the water in this area, right? Well, some things you do need to do a little bit of work on, right? Well, how much water is that going to be? Do I have to, do I know that, right? Because you might think, okay, well, I know how much water is there now, but of course, you put a dam up there, it's going to fill up, right? So, okay, how much water could there be? Well then, okay, so how much water does this year, but how do I take into account for 
perhaps different seasonal variations and different years and you know a really big flood year what happens right but leave the head rainstorm so all of a sudden you find yourself doing all sorts of you know scenarios and trying to plan and um do all that right but the challenge is of course you end up really overbuilding is like oh my gosh i need to make sure this handles a once in 500 year once in 100 year storm or something etc cetera, etc cetera. when it comes to horror design it's a similar issue right where we can do our best to plan and say hey this horror block is this much of the clock period this horror block is as much of the clock period but once you actually push things through the tools that may not be how it works out. I mean, it turns out that this block is faster than anticipated or slower, obviously more common. Uh, and how am I supposed to predict this, right? How am I supposed to, at the beginning of my design process, allocate the clock budget between different components of the design if I don't really know how much they're going to cost, right? Um, and so the main people in the audience, these agile uh, you know, mentalities I'm describing may sound very familiar. Um, and this is the reason why is that this is very common in software. So to some people, agile in software is good. Uh, patented like trademark, it has certain uh, properties and you're like, oh yes, if I'm doing agile, I have to be doing like scrum meetings. Or I need to use a certain type of like tracking software for progress. I have a velocity and all those other things. Here you're taking a little bit more generally, right? It's just more this mentality of embracing this iterative, revisionary, evolutionary kind of way of doing design, right? And kind of the key thing is this thing right here, as you know, when you think about design is kind of more flexible and fluid, right? If you think of your design as something that's really rigid that you don't want to get wrong, then you kind of get pulled more towards a waterfall. And guess what? If you're building something like a dam where you're looking to pour concrete once, that makes sense, right? Because you don't want to pour concrete and say, you know what? Actually, I want to move that dam one foot to the left. We've got to do it all over again. That's really hard to do. With software, wait, you just change a line of code, right? And then you recompile. And maybe compilation takes a little bit of time, but it's still computer effort, not human effort. And you can do it again. And you can see how it looks. And that's the whole point. We want to take that same kind of flexibility, fluidity, and bring the hardware design, right? Say, so you know what? Yes, we had this hard design. But what if we change this little way here? What if we change it a little way there? What if we change this other way? And by doing it in those various ways, we can then put it all together. And so uh, that's that's the goal here, right? That's kind of the whole point of this course is just figuring out how can we make this hardware design process much more fluid uh, and flexible and thus we can be much more nimble, right? And so if you contrast this to prior hard design practices, right? Part of the reason why so many things look more waterfall-like was these hardware design practices were um, more, uh, you know, water, more rigid, right? So for example, writing Verilog, for those of you who've done it before, you know that, yes, you can write Verilog, you can get it right, but it's, it's a fair amount of effort. You need to really get your every last little detail right. And even by the time you manage to get it all written, it takes a fair amount of effort to get it correct. And then even more effort to make sure you convince yourself it's correct, right? So by the time you go through all the effort, oof, and someone tells you you want to change it, no, no, right? It's, it's too much. It's, it's like writing Verilog is kind of like pouring concrete, right? And so what we're going to do in this course, we're going to use some newer technologies, newer tools, newer languages that allow us to be much more flexible, more nimble. Okay, so as I said, what's the whole point of doing this for hardware design? As I said before, number one problem we're trying to solve is reducing designing effort and designing costs, thus enabling a lot more people to get involved in design, which would be great. But it's not the only benefit, right? So the recent time design benefit, of course, you know, design cost is good. You know, we're going to see this agile process. We can more uh, better uh, guide our results. And it's not just that, but we actually improve the overall result to get all together, right? So um, it's one thing to try best to plan something out in advance, but how well can you possibly know how good certain components are when you actually start seeing how they fit together and seeing how well they're doing and start optimizing and we start seeing what's happening, right? And you can do this effectively profile guided optimization. So perhaps from your software experiences and training, you may have been told that you know things like premature optimization causes all sorts of problems and root of all evil. Um, but what, what are these people getting at? The thing they're mostly getting at is that you know uh, don't do things blindly, right? If you're optimizing something, it turns out to be not the actual bottleneck for your application. That's a wasted effort, and perhaps could even reduce complexity or bugs to your software you don't want to have. The same is true for hardware, right? We know techniques how to make hardware more efficient. We know how to do things like pipelining and banking and you know paralyzing, paralyzing and specialization to really go after certain components. However, we're not going to do that um, unless we know we need to do it, right? If we do it for everything all the time, that's wasteful. And maybe once again, that, that complexity of optimization that's not necessary could actually you know cause bugs, make things worse. We really want to know we're putting in places where we need. And so this agile approach where we're going to get things going. Get the entire design through the flow, get the entire science through the tools, and start seeing results and start saying, you know what? We don't have all the features we need right away, but at this moment, early on, we can see that 
even for the subset functionality we're going for, we are just far from our desired, you know, performance level, just far from desired power budget level. We're gonna need ahead and go after these, and you can go ahead and analyze it and see. Oh wait, I should spend my effort on this block. This is where the most of the time is going, and perhaps I believe there's a way for me to improve that, right? So this agile approach is a really good way to do that. It's, it's kind of almost in a way. It's, the more you kind of imbibe this mentality, it's almost even offensive to think about the waterfall approach. It's like, how can somebody possibly expect to really know in advance how these things are going to pan out? Because the more you work with these tools, the more you see there's all sorts of things going on. So it's really important to kind of get things moving, get things flowing through the tools, start seeing numbers, and then have insights to really reach apply your efforts, right? And the final benefit of the agile process is actually much more increased predictability for design. Right, um, and that's the thing, right? And you have this you know, waterfall approach where everyone builds their own blocks in isolation and starts putting them all together. What happens is when those blocks turn out to be like effectively impossible to build, right? You specify it on paper, it seems like a perfect plan, but what happens if you ask somebody to do something that's like impossible? You said you need to get X, Y, and Z done in this area budget, in this time budget, and they can't do it, right? Um, and there's all sorts of, you know, fantastic failures in the software world of people trying to do massive software projects that are, you know, written from scratch and then complete rewrites and everything. And they go horribly wrong, right? They are way behind schedule, way over budget and don't work very well, right? And some famous cases from late nineties, I know various OS projects from various uh, vendors that really went south this way, right? And so it's not really learned this lesson, right? That, you know, these massive undertakings, waterfall stuff approach, that may work for building dams, but it's not good for building software, right? You want to embrace the fact that software is much more nimble and you can really just kind of change it, right? And so who in the right mind in 2021 would start like an OS project, which you know is going to be like, you know, tens of millions of lines of source code from scratch. No, you're constantly kind of, you know, iterating and improving something that already works, right? And even like Linux, which, you know, is now quite big, started quite small and was iteratively revised, revised and expanded and improved, right? And even cloud services today, you no, know, these aren't things from scratch. These are revised, iterated, and improved, right? So this, this is really one out in software. Like I said, the whole point of this course is we want to take that mentality, take that insight, and apply it to hardware design. Okay. So um, you may hear me use multiple terms of this course. I didn't want to take a moment to kind of contrast these two, make them very clear, right? So uh, when I talk about agile, I'm talking about you know a certain set of mentalities of I mean, you know, these rapid iteration, this kind of nimble mindset. Uh, at the same time, a lot of things we're using in this course are open source, right? Technically, whether something is agile or open source, those are orthogonal concepts, right? Uh, you could do agile with closed source proprietary tools. Likewise, um, if you really wanted to, you could do open source in a waterfall fashion, right? Open source just means the tools or the uh, components you're using are freely available and usable. Um, and so, you know, in reality, for most groups, it's probably going to do a mix. They're probably going to have some tools that are open source. Maybe some tools are still proprietary. Maybe some components in their design are open source. Maybe some components are proprietary. That may be very common in the coming years in the industry, and it's already happening for many companies out there already. Um, maybe some products, especially in academia, may be entirely open source, both tools and uh, components. That could be cool. Uh, but this can all happen, right? And so uh, this, these are orthogonal concepts. You might hear me mention one or both, but understand they are different, right? And then kind of bring it back to the whole point we're doing this, right, is that we're going through this agile process to reduce design costs, make it more predictable, produce better results. But reducing these hard design costs has some really nice benefits, right? And not just, you know, saving industry and bailing them out, but um, by reducing costs, a lot more people can participate, right? And that's really uh, exciting, right? Where, you know, it doesn't need to be just a handful of large companies doing their massive, you know, products. If instead, we have a lot more people participate, it really opens things up. And it's just a very recent example of this. You can look at the rise of the RISC-V ecosystem where, you know, when RISC-V was started, there weren't very many open ISAs and most ISAs that were used were proprietary and locked in. As a result, there was only a handful of companies that could sell cores and a lot of companies wanted to sell cores or perhaps not even sell cores, but they want to make the product, but they needed a core and they couldn't afford to get a core, couldn't afford to get an ISA license and they're kind of locked out. All of a sudden, risk five, all these little tiny random companies sprung up because they're like, or were able to get their foot in the door because wait a second, all they needed was a core. And now if a core, they're off to the races, right? And you need an ISA to build a core. And so building these open ecosystems really helps, right? And it's kind of amazing how you build an open ecosystem, you can make costs lower, you can bring in a lot more people. And there's a lot of exciting new things coming in, a lot more diversity, uh, both products and people and everything. So that's something that's really cool. And so by reducing hardware design costs, we also can democratize this hardware design process. Cool. So 
Uh, maybe I'll go back a slide here and pause for any questions so far. Um, let's see if there's any. Okay, I'm checking the chats. Okay, well then I will continue. So let's uh, talk about this whole point. So we're saying, you know, we really want to reduce design costs, this agile approach of kind of constantly iterating or revising. But more generally, how can we make design uh, cheaper? Well, um, reuse, right? So think about when you're designing a hardware block. What's the fastest hardware block for you to develop? The answer, of course, is the one that you don't write, the one that's already there, right? <laughs> right? And it turns out, if you look at hardware designs, um, they often contain very similar components. Now, maybe they aren't exactly the same, but they're very, very similar. Sometimes they are the same. Sometimes, you know, they do need the exact same, you know, Axie uh, bus adapter, right? Maybe they need some sort of crossbar or a cache with some similar parameters, right? And so as a result, uh, you know, a lot of hardware design groups kind of keep reinventing the wheel, right? They kind of keep building the same things over and over again. So you may be wondering why they keep doing this. We'll come to that in a second. But for now, the kind of point imagine is imagine a world where you can reuse a lot of components in your hardware design. So you can spend your time mostly on the thing that makes your design unique, which could just be the integration of existing components, but the way you chose to integrate them. Um, and so reuse would be fantastic, right? Now, although reuse would be fantastic, in order to do reuse, you know, the component needs to do the right thing, right? If you say, I need X, and someone's like, well, here's something that's X.2, it's not quite the same. It's like, yeah, they both have X in the name, but it's, it's not the same thing, right? I need this thing from my design. Also, if you're gonna take a block from someone else and you reuse it, you wanna know it's right. You wanna know it's correct, right? If someone just chucks some code at you, you're like, that's great, but you know, do I, do I trust this? And so let's talk more about this reuse issue, right? So um, for reuse, they said the goal is to have this block as something that does the problem you need for your scenario, solve that problem, as well as something you can trust. And a key thing we're covering this course repeatedly is this notion of a hardware generator, right? So before we get to the solution, let's talk a little more to the problem, right? The problem is that, is that even though your description of what you may want to have done is very similar to what else did, it's not exactly the same. And so if you have their very log code, which is like poured concrete, how hard is it to change it to do what you need, right? Um, and that could be a problem, right? But meanwhile, a generator isn't a single design. A, design, a generator produces uh, designs based on input parameters, right? So you can say things like, I want to change design this way, and thus you can tailor it to your situation, right? And thus that additional flexibility increases the odds, the output of the generator is more reusable, right? Um, and so this is actually already being started and done in an industry, independent from the language talked about in this course, right? Where, for example, for something like maybe a, a crossbar or some other components, uh, it's really hard to write that in Verilog. Why? Well, because how many ports do you want in your crossbar? How wide do you want each port on your crossbar? Uh, some of these kind of things are really hard to parameterize in Verilog, and so what ends up happening? Well, you end up making a generator, uh, but you make a generator in multiple languages. And we'll come up to us in a few minutes about how using a language like Chisel, which we're using in this course, we can have a single a language. But independent of languages, the point is that you recognize very quickly that there's kind of some common patterns. I mean, I have to kind of include all those common patterns into a single tool, i.e. a generator, and thus people can reuse and get the benefit of it. And so that's the whole point of generators. Now, once again, sprinkling in that open source keyword, open source has another nice wrinkle to this, right? Uh, one time you may not be able to reuse this simply because the thing you want does exist, but it's proprietary. And perhaps your company or organization can't afford licensing costs or whatever. However, if it's open source, now you can access it, right, because it's free. Now, obviously having free things, it sounds nice, nicer than paying for things, but the generator interacts with it in an interesting way in the sense that because the generator is more flexible and thus more reusable, a larger number of potential users could benefit from it. And so now it was something that perhaps didn't have enough mass behind it, enough interest to, gen to have a, a sufficient critical mass for community to actually build it. Now with a generator, it is more flexible and so there is a chance if a big enough community actually can build this thing and support it, right? And so this kind of thing happens all the time, right? Where recently, um, I date myself, many years ago as an undergrad, uh, I was for research, I was tasked with creating a floating point unit or FPU, right? Now, uh, you may be wondering, well, gee, that sounds something that probably already exists. And the answer is, of course it does. But at that time, there were no open source FPUs anywhere, right? 
none. And, you know, you could do things like, you know, even on a Xilinx FPJ, you could use the Xilinx FPJ tools to synthesize perhaps a single floating point operation. And then you can kind of stitch those together, build an FPU, but they didn't exist, right? And then not too many years later, uh, as part of the rocket ship project, which you'll hear about more later in this course, uh, individuals developed a FPU just along the way. But FPU being an open source FPU uh, was a hugely valuable tool in the industry. And people that had zero interest in risk five or even chisel uh, all of a sudden really wanted this thing because, oh my gosh, it's an FPU, right? And so uh, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Well, like I said, it's the, the generator made it more flexible, right? Because part of the challenge of FPU is that you have to get the exact bit widths to certain formats, but you know, what if you want single precision versus double precision? And even when you do have, you know, the same operations and the same requirements, depending on you choose to optimize how much you pipeline certain things, where you choose to share certain components or have different components, right? Do you use the FMA to do multiplies and adds, or do you have separate multipliers and adders, or how do you do all this, right? Those kinds of choices, by putting those into a generator, this FPU is actually quite reusable, and does have a wider community. It's really taken off, right? And so that's an example where, you know, open source and generation combined can really do some cool things. And so I said, that's the kind of thing I want to think about this course, and we're thinking about this, is rather thinking about hardware design is this process of where I have this soft cushy idea of a design in my head, and I'm going to write RTL, and that's design is static and it's done, no, instead, there's going to be this not only design is flexible, but there's a design generation step, right? So you have design flow. Another step in the flow is a program you like this run, i.e., a generator, and that program generates the design specific to this particular instance, right? And so it's not going to produce any arbitrary hardware. It's not going to take any arbitrary code and produce hardware, but you no, know, for design generator, you know, you know, a certain thing, like say I want to have a generator for cache, I want to make a generator for a certain crossbar or something, in which case, then you can go ahead and build that. Cool. So uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to be using this language in this course called CHISL, or Constructing Hardware, which is an acronym for Constructing Hardware in a Scala Embedded Language. Uh, so this is an interesting development, right? So uh, there's actually a fun lineage of uh, research languages for hardware design. There's been quite a few made over the years. Uh, it goes back quite some time. There's quite a bunch of them going on currently. Even uh, in the research group, Grayson and myself, uh, Jose Renau's group, there's a language called Pyrope, which has been in development for quite a few years. It's yet another hard development language. So there's all these languages out there to climb the question is, well, wait a second. Well, why, why, what makes Chisel special? Chisel is a pragmatic balance, right? On the one hand, even though it was originally a research language, it's actually matured a fair amount. Uh, and it's been used in commercial products from multiple vendors. It has multiple organizations contributing back to it. So it's actually in some ways perhaps the most mature of the next generation of languages. Um, it's a name drop for a moment, right, in terms of which organizations have been either using it or contributing back to it. We're talking about not just people like sci-fi, but also Google, Intel, and IBM, right? So they've all either contributed to or used Chisel for design. And so it's, it's kind of this fun thing that you're getting some traction, right? Uh, there's a lot of other languages that are similar and there's overlapping features. Um, the thing that I think most are most compelling about Chisel help us most in this course is really its ability to help us make these generators. So to make these generators, there's going to be a couple of things we're going to use in the language, which is Scala, the, the base language we're using, in particular, the object-oriented features and the functional programming features. Those features from the base language allow us to get really nice reuse tricks uh, to build these generators, right? We can imagine object-oriented tricks, of course, you can build nice class hierarchies and mix things together and reuse things in that sense and abstract things the right way we would like. With the functional programming features, we're able to kind of make these really beautiful connections for using functional programming, you know, things like map, et cetera, or fold, to create the topology of the connections we need and make it in a very arbitrary, flexible way. Right. And so, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, industry has known about generators for a while. Uh, standard practice in many companies is to kind of stitch together things. So, let's say you're trying to build a crossbar generator. Maybe you write down some language, uh, would it be Perl, Java, Python? And that thing stitches together strings that happen to be very long to do the thing you want. So somebody to think about, okay, if I change the number of ports or the port width, here are the things that need to change inside the Verilog. And so I'm going to make this program some other language. It spits out strings uh, that produces the Verilog I want, right? And so that works. People do it. This is, in some cases, very standard practice. But it's obviously some downsides, right? The biggest one being that by having mixing together two languages, it's completely flying blind, right? You took the generator code. And then you got to run the outputs through the tool flow and see if it doesn't crash or not, right? It's like there's no typing information kind of lost. It's, 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 it's rough, right? And so the language like Chisel is nice because you're doing it all in one language. You have the full programming power of this expressive language called Scala. 
and at the same time producing hardware. And so that's kind of the thing about languages and your choice preference courses. So of these new languages, there's quite a few out there. This one has um, significant adoption. However, you know, as I said, these, there's no unique feature you can point to Chisel and say, ah, no language doesn't have that, right? Why not? Well, I mean, for example, I said Chisel, you know, takes advantage of functional programming or even Scala. Well, even in Scala, there's a language called Spinal, which is a fork of Chisel, but uh, it's already in also another similar Scala-based language. Or if you want to say, I really care about the functional aspects, um, there's quite a few languages that also take functional languages. You know, something like uh, Clash uses Haskell. It's actually around the same age as Chisel. And so there's quite a few languages out there. And hopefully, as a result of taking this course, we'll give you the skills not only to be comfortable with these kind of more new languages and working with new tool flows, but you know, circumstances to have you interested in our language, go do it, right? Go learn our language, go learn our tool flow. That's great. For this course, we need to use Chisel because said, like, because Verilog is not going to get it done. We need to have that flexibility. Um, Scott, and so when it comes to this course, uh, we don't expect necessarily people to know Chisel or Scala in advance. That's okay. We're going to cover those things. Uh, and Scala is kind of fun. Um, if you haven't had a chance to play with this language, uh, it technically it's another Java-based language that runs on top of the JVM. Uh, it has a really strong static type system. It's one of the nicest features. It helps us try and catch a lot of errors at compile time. That's kind of one of the main mentalities. But at the same time, we're not constantly putting types of things. We actually can often use type inference, and it works just fine. Uh, additionally, for learning how to play with things, uh, it has a REPL interpreter mode. You can kind of type things and try it out. You can also run it inside a Jupyter Notebook. Cool. Uh, and so starting to kind of get more into the course and less about the background, there's some common themes you're going to see throughout this course. And so these are four themes you're going to see throughout this course. I'm often going to perhaps even figure out some sort of graphical icons to represent these things. You kind of see me point out the same thing up and over and over again. But these are things I think are kind of really important. Number one, close the loops, kind of thing you saying, right? And that is what we want to do is this mentality. We're going to improve through iteration or revision, right? We're not going to say here's our perfect design beginning we have to follow this and that's perfect and that's what we got to do it. No, we're instead going to say we're going to keep adapting and improving, right? It's kind of constant revision, constant improvement, right? And we, we do this a lot and I'm thinking about it, right? Perhaps, you know, you have to write uh, an essay or even a research paper. You probably initially have an outline, right? And you, and you, you try it, but I can't think of anybody that's written anything that's worth reading that strictly followed their outline they had from before they started writing, right? That's just unimaginable, right? No, what happens is you have your outline, you write some portions, maybe you go revise your outline, maybe you don't even bother revising your outline, but you write the text and you keep revising text. Anyone that's written text is good knows in order to get it good, it takes a lot of work, a lot of revising, a lot of rewriting. And so eventually you do get something that's pretty good, but there's no way you could know that in advance, right? Um, and the exact outline, exact structure, right? And so um, the point for hard design is this closed loop mentality of, Get the whole thing going, right? Get the minimal viable thing going, push it through the tools, get area numbers, get performance numbers, start testing parts, and then you can go ahead and start, you know, adding more features, adding more automations. Even if you're building a block the first time, you may say, oh, wait, I know I need to do this, this, and this. Write that down, save those ideas. Don't do those optimizations until you know you need them, right? Uh, okay, I think I saw a chat come by. Um, okay. Um, Go ahead and do that. Okay, so um, close the loop, number one. Number two, you can kind of see for this whole productivity argument, design for reuse, right? And so this is good for many reasons. We talked about reuse is great, you know, increased productivity. Also, we're using things, hopefully things are high quality. You're less likely to get things wrong, right? You know, hopefully in your software courses, you're learning how even though we make you often develop data structures for course assignments. In practice, we strongly encourage you to use, you know, standard library kind of components. Uh, same thing's true for hardware, right? If we can have these high quality components that are reusable, that can help us have fewer errors. Um, and then additionally, right, uh, you know, as you see here, design for reuse is also about um, trying to uh, build generators and use generators, right? So we're talking about how can we think about our design in a way that makes it uh, amenable to generation, et cetera. And these other two uh, may sound obvious, but I think it's important to kind of imbibe them and believe by them, right? Number one, make tools do the work, right? And so I can't tell you often in hardware design or even sometimes uh, in software, people don't fully trust tools ability to optimize things and they go ahead and they optimize things manually. And by sometimes manually performed optimizations, um, not only are you changing the design or changing semantics and tools are now obligated to implement the new thing you've given them, it may actually not be better off, right? Um, 
you know, best case scenario, you optimize something, okay, and it gets the optimization you're hoping for. But worst case scenario, your code just longer and perhaps no more efficient, or perhaps you're even constrained in a way where it can't be made more efficient, right? And so it's worth understanding uh, how these tools work, what they can and can't do, and knowing how to tweak your code, right? Perhaps there's optimization you'd like the tools to do. Look at the output, you're being diligent. You see it's not doing optimization. And so thus, what do you do? Well, you go do it manually, but maybe it's the best thing to do. Maybe instead of doing it manually, what you should do is you should uh, figure out why a tool is not optimization for you and then tweak your input subtly to do it, right? So in case of some language like C, sometimes a single keyword can do it, right? Uh, with these hardware design tools, maybe it's not quite so obvious sometimes, but we'll work on that, right? And the goal is, whenever possible, make the tools do the work. This will be extremely uh, apparent when we talk about optimization, where in some cases where humans spend a lot of time optimizing certain things in hardware design, for example, things like pipelining, you know, trying to balance various levels of your uh, registers, again, exact right balance to make sure all the critical paths are balanced, and moving things back and forth across registers. Tools can do that. It's a process called retiming. It's been around for now about 20 years. And so how do you design your, your design in a way that the tools can do automatic retiming rather than you manually allocating pipeline stages is a good example, right? Um, and so we'll talk about that. And then the fourth one is designed for readability. You may see similar things espoused in your software courses, right? And that is that, you know, in general code is read many more times than it's written. Realize that, you know, people reading your code may not know what you're thinking when you're writing it. That could be yourself just a few weeks or months later. And so we really want to emphasize things we can do to make this code less surprising and more clear. And this is a common problem with functional programming languages is that if one is overly ambitious with certain functional programming features and not careful the way they're using them, they can make code that's very compact, but perhaps not super clear. And so we're gonna talk about ways to make sure we're using these features judiciously in a way that's understandable and clear. Okay, so with that in mind, um, let's talk about this course some more. Uh, unless there's any more questions. Okay, no. So uh, as you've seen from the course announcements, um, I would like to have this course be really uh, welcoming to a lot of different groups. I really want to bring more people into hardware design, uh, especially folks with stronger software backgrounds or hardware curious, let's try and get this going, right? So as you can see, this course is kind of combining three different skill sets. And so one of those, you know, classic hardware design skills, you know, have you use a language like Verilog or VHDL to write RTL and, you know, build a hardware component. Another set of skills that might be relevant is computer architecture. We actually are not going to talk about instructions or risk five in this course, but just being familiar with some more general architectural concepts about things like locality and stuff like that may help. Uh, and then finally is this advanced programming, right? In particular, we're talking about object-oriented and functional programming. So since we're requesting skill sets from you know, three different domains, um, we don't expect everybody to know all three of these coming in. So we're gonna do our best to have a very nice, very gradual way to ramp up our curriculum to include everybody we can. However, to kind of keep that manageable, we recommend that you know, have at least some amount of experience with two out of these three, if you have three out of three, that's great, fantastic. Um, and if you're concerned about this, uh, I'll be staying on this call uh, afterwards and we can talk. At that point, I have an impromptu office hours so we can send me an email, we can continue to discuss some more, right? But like I said, I would really like to uh, broaden the scope of those people who are involved in hardware design and really get a lot more people involved. And I think this is kind of cool because we can set up this course, these adults and needs are thinking about Hard design rather being a single static fixed thing, but it's a program that produces a design. It's a different mindset. And I'd love to bring in that kind of more software, more creative folks into hardware design to kind of get that going. Cool. And then this is now at the very end, but why, why is this here? Well, who are you? Well, so as I discussed before, I'm a professor in the CC department. Some of you may have already taken a course with me. Um, and my interests, of course, are in architecture and open source hardware design, agile hardware development, et cetera. Um, as you see here, my office hours this quarter will be on Tuesdays and Fridays. And I'm saying on today, if there's any additional questions. Um, I'm also very grateful this quarter to have the help of a TA, uh, Jason Vranick. So Jason's a uh, research student, a, group, a student of a research group, but he's also doing this stuff uh, on day to day, right? So he's actually been writing Chisel now for probably about almost 18 months or at least a year. Uh, and there's some really cool stuff with it. It's built some really cool sophisticated generators and I'm really happy to have him help him make this course. And so two of us together, I'm working to make this course and we're really excited about it. Uh, so let's talk more about this actual course in terms of what's gonna happen. So um, first off, this is an elective grad course, right? So let's take advantage of that context, right? Let's have some fun, make it interesting. Uh, yes, it's open to undergrads, right? So I'm, it's not, even though it's simply a grad course, uh, people think there's some sort of magic difference between undergrads and grads. Uh, 
maybe it's just a piece of paper, right? Because, you know, under, undergrads are taking plenty of division courses, right? So they can be plenty more left in their skill sets. So I'm more than happy to include advanced undergrads where I take this course. Let's, let's go forward. So what's involved in this course? Well, as you can see right now, there's lectures. Uh, that's where I'm going to be talking. And I'm going to try my best to be more inclusive of speaking. Hopefully I have technology figured out where I'm in a more quiet environment uh, in the future. And we we'll have such a crazy setup and we'll have you guys have your webcams on and talking to each other and that won't go into public recording. Um, but additionally, uh, there's a course going to be the coursework done by the students. So there's three main categories, right? There's going to be labs and homework and then a project. And so the way this course is going to work is in the first roughly two thirds of the course, uh, it's what I call the structured portion where we're going to have, you know, regular lectures. Uh, there's going to be lab assignments, homework assignments, typically one lab, one homework per week. The first labs and homeworks are not going to be due until next week, so don't worry about today. Um, and you kind of see how that flows, right? You have you know three lectures, and then three lectures worth of material. You're going to have a lab and a homework assignment based on it. Um, we'll come to the differences between labs and homeworks in a few minutes. Meanwhile, at the end of the course, the final third, that'll be a chance to put everything you put together, learn to put together into a project, right? Um, so rather than solving a specific problem, we tell you on the homework. Instead, you're going to be doing a project uh, where you're working with someone else. And you're going to be putting these agile practices to work, and that'll be fun. And during that time portion, we will still have uh, this lecture time slot. Uh, there'll be some more open-ended, more advanced lectures, as well as the occasional guest speaker. And at the very end, we'll have project presentations. So we'll come, we'll come down in a few minutes. Um, so as you can see, this course is kind of constantly in flux. Uh, you know, today I had to launch, right? You know, I had to make it work. I had to make this lecture work. But I'm going to keep improving, right? Hopefully, I'll figure out a way to get a uh, more reliable network set up either back to my bedroom where it's quieter, or I'll figure out a way to bring my comforts in my office, you know, would it be the monitors and such, the living room so I can see more things at once. So like I said, constantly improving, constantly revising. Let's go, let's go forward that mindset. And so this course, we're gonna do our best to keep revising and improving. But yes, this is the first time we've offered this course, uh, but we hope to make it offered a lot. And so uh, as part of that, uh, we're making this course a lot of open access and open source as best we can. So that way, even folks who aren't involved in Santa Cruz or aren't here taking this course this term can still benefit from materials. But this term, of course, our primary focus is us as staff, myself and uh, Jason and TA, is we're trying to make this experience great for students in the course this term, but we're also trying to keep all the materials available for everyone else. Great. So as you can see, lectures, uh, you know, are this time going to be live via Zoom, the push recordings publicly on the open internet on YouTube. And normally, the recordings will only capture my uh, self and slides, and but it will be decoupled from the audio and video uh, from Zoom. Uh, and yeah, I would love for you to have a nice community here. Uh, I'm happy to see we have more students showing up than enrolled. We have room. Keep keep coming. Um, I like that little nice little community here. Uh, and then, uh, as you can see, these presentations uh, I'm presenting actually, believe it or not, from a Jupyter notebook. And so we'll be using Jupyter a decent amount in this course. Um, and what's fun about doing these notebooks isn't just kind of, you know, imbibing this network concept, but we can do a few things, right? Number one, I as an instructor can, you know, execute code uh, live on the slides and show you examples live on the slide and change codes. Um, but what's also cool is n plus use in advance, today's a little bit of a hiccup, of course, and you'll be able to modify these notebooks yourself, right? So if you want to go in and take some notes, you know, uh, you know, you can go uh, modify it, no problem, while I, uh, your, your copy. Uh, you know, no problem while it's happening in live time. You can run the code yourself and play around with it, right? And so um, that's kind of a nice, fun feature to play with taking advantage technology, right? We're here in this course, we're using a lot of cool technologies for, uh, you know, the, the doing for hardware design, but might as well take advantage of everything we can do um, right now, right? There's a lot of new technologies for teaching, and in particular in this interesting dynamic where normally remote is a disadvantage. But in this case, recognizing that, wait, because we're remote, everybody's in front of a laptop. Let's make take advantage of that, right? Normally in a regular classroom, everyone's not in front of a laptop. So maybe it's more a little bit more interactive and hopefully you've seen the following lectures, we have snippets of code you can kind of run and play with yourself while I'm talking. Um, this is a brief uh, comment about the Jupyter Notebooks, the way this works. And so uh, perhaps most of you are used to notebooks running in your browser. That's, this is just zoomed in. Uh, you can perhaps when you're taking notes, you might prefer to do it in a notebook view. That's not the presentation view, which I'm running right now. You still see the exact same content. It's just you know perhaps formatted a little differently. But these are things you can discover for yourself as you're uh, working with that. Cool. Okay. So then the labs. So labs are an opportunity to kind of get very focused experiences. And so for the first weeks especially, 
were really uh, geared in on trying to convey features of both Chisel and to get there, sometimes some features of Scala to help you get that point. So sometimes a very specific feature we want to kind of demonstrate and ask you to apply, you know, and so the solution to some of these assignments in the labs may be, uh, you know, only a few lines. Like, you know, okay, use this feature to solve in this gap in this code. You know, use this other feature to solve this gap in this code. Um, and so we kind of have these very structured kind of controlled uh, environments for these labs. And the labs, hopefully, even though they're, you know, you have a week to do it, you hopefully get it done pretty quickly on. And then you move on to homework problems which are much more open-ended, right? And so like I said, the labs are going to be these Jupyter notebooks. Um, and that'll be nice. Now, um, the brief note in terms of resources, uh, for students enrolled in the course, we're going to be posting information on the Canvas, the internal website, about how to request and get access to internal compute resources. On those internal compute resources, you'll have access to what's called a Jupyter Hub, i.e. a place where we're going to launch to Jupyter for you. The reason why this is nice is that way you can solve your lab on that system and then hit a button and it takes care of submission for you and auto grading for you. And you'll get a result hopefully pretty quickly to let you know if you're done. And once you get full points, yeah, you're done and you can move on, right? If you want to do these, notebook, these labs locally, you can. The labs are posted publicly, so everyone even not involved in this course can still access them. It's just this auto grading feature is going to be accessible behind this uh, compute resource. Um, cool. And then in terms of the homeworks, so these are much more substantial design opportunities. And so these aren't going to be done in the notebook. These are going to be done instead uh, using a more kind of conventional uh, tool environment. Um, you're going to be writing Scala coach with Chisel, and then you're going to solve the problems we suggest. And then you can submit your Chisel files to Gradescope. And we're going to try and set up uh, auto graders on Gradescope to handle all this. Um, understand that these auto graders are going to be triggered you know, after a deadline and used to actually grade, as opposed to the lab ones. We're going to have that set to run as soon as you submit it, right? So you can submit as many times you need in advance and see the results. And you can, you know, stop submitting when you see you finally get that perfect score for the labs. For the homeworks, we're going to give you some tests. They aren't always going to be exhaustive. So you perhaps may want to test additionally yourself. But we're not going to run the auto grader and the grading until after deadline. So it's up to you to convince yourself as correct. Now, when it comes to homework, you know, we've all developed things and all run the challenges. And so to make this more uh, flexible, you know, embracing this agile mindset, we have this concept of slip days, which you may have had something similar in other courses. So slip day is simply a, you know, consequence free opportunity to turn in something late, right? And so you're gonna get three days of slip uh, for homework assignments. So uh, anytime you use a slip day, you use a whole energy amount. So let's say you're only an hour late, you actually have another 23 hours. So you might as well get your money's worth and really make sure it's right. <laughs> Cause you're, you're gonna be billed for one slip day. But you could use one slip day on three assignments. You could use three slip days on one assignment. Or believe it or not, sometimes students forget this, you can use zero slip days all quarter. That's also possible. <laughs> um, but it's just a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of tolerance. If you're taking other courses than me, I've often been more strict about deadlines. That's usually because there's concerns about me posting solutions, in which case then it's kind of hard for you to preview the work without solutions, having access to solutions. Or is there like a really, really tight schedule and what you came behind? This course, um, it's going to move quickly at times, so I don't recommend getting behind, but we understand that, you know, sometimes it's hard to get code working, so that's where we're able to have the slip day policy. Cool. And then, as I said, finally, there's a project. It's kind of the final portion of the project, uh, of the course. The earlier assignments, the labs can be done in groups, be submitted individually. The homeworks are definitely be done individually. The project can have a partner. And yeah, and go ahead and build some sort of chisel generated together. And so if that sounds really daunting. Hopefully, the skills you learn make this much more approachable. Additionally, you can iterate with the staff, talking things over and figuring out, you know, what you're proposing. We'll try and make sure it's a reasonable size, reasonable scope, and reasonable flexing, and give you some good pointers, right? And kind of guide you along that process. Um, but throughout this quarter, definitely do think of who you might want to work with for that project, as well as what you might want to build a generator for. And then, well, what you, what's the outcome of this? Well, you're going to create this generator. So generator is going to be, you know, chisel code. You're going to write uh, documentation for it. So it's going to be technically called chisel or Scala doc. Um, and you're going to present this briefly, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, depending on students in the course, to your classmates at the last week of instruction. Um, and you're also, of course, submit the code to us as staff. Now, that, that's going to be it. Since you've went through all this effort, we would like to encourage you open source it, but that's by no means uh, required, uh, or nor will have any impact on your grade. Um, speaking of grades, sorry, I think I glossed over that. I should go back. Uh, the percentages in the lower left here, those are the percentages for the overall grade. Uh, so you may notice there's a category that's uh, missing, i.e. exams. No exams in this course. Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine how to have like a 
code writing design exam. So when the person having an elective grad course, we're not required to give an exam. So we're not required to give an exam. And so let's, let's, let's have some fun and really focus on um, doing a good job and playing with these concepts and playing around with uh, the designs. Uh, cool. Okay, that's a lot of logistics. Maybe I'm gonna pause here if there's any questions. I'm gonna keep an eye on the chat for just a moment. Okay. So, uh, as I said before, uh, oops, sorry, chat just came in. Okay, I'm gonna go back a slide. Okay, so two questions. So one question, is Jupiter free? Yes, so for those unfamiliar with Jupiter, Jupiter is an environment where you can uh, use these notebooks uh, in a browser. It's kind of a nice way to kind of mix uh, code and results in a very uh, fun way. Uh, it's primarily developed in Python and JavaScript, and yes, it's free. Um, and so if you'd like to install it locally, you can. Uh, we'll be setting up a, an environment for you to run it on our server. The only advantage you're running on our server is that's you know, a few things to run uh, on your computer, as well as it's gonna have access to the autograders, which, which we're not gonna post. Um, you also have access to the server if you go through the instructions which we're gonna post on Canvas later this week. You can also just run other things there. So especially later on in this course, some activities we're doing may be more demanding of your computer, for example, with your generator, you might do something like a design space exploration. That is to generate multiple versions of your design that actually do the same functionality, but have different implementations and different trade-offs and you wanna see which one's better. And so rather than turning your laptop into a space heater, you can go ahead and turn our server into a space heater, right? And that's what we're gonna, one of the things we'll provide in this course. And so this is a server from our research group, but it's pretty pretty meaty and this course is not too big. So we're pretty sure this could work out fine. Um, so that we're, we're talking about how to provide access to uh, set online via Canvas for those of you enrolled in the course, for those of you uh, outside of the course. Um, if you're in the Santa Cruz community and you're auditing, we can provide access. Uh, if you're outside the Santa Cruz community, I'm afraid we're not going to provide access, but we'll still put all the code we can online for you to run it yourself. And Jupyter is not, you know, impossible to install. Many platforms, you can simply just do some sort of uh, package manager install for Jupyter. Uh, and boom, you have Jupyter. Now to do Scala and Chisel, you need something else called Almond. There's like an eight line sequence to install that. And that's gonna be put in the public web page to kind of see how that's covered. Cool, okay, I'm just going down this list. Uh, yeah, so then someone mentioned here, if you choose to audit, they said, yes, if you choose to audit, uh, if you're in part of Santa Cruz community, we can give you provisional access. Um, uh, but yes, uh, okay. And then the other question is for homeworks, wait, can we resubmit homework to get a score we like? So unfortunately not for homeworks. I said, so for, for, for labs, we're giving the auto graders running on submission for homeworks, we want you to um, do a lot of testing yourself. Uh, and um, uh, so, you know, unfortunately, homeworks are going to run the auto graders after a deadline. Yes, but for labs, yes, you can keep resubmitting. That'll be the advantage of logging to our server is that way uh, it's able to give you kind of a controlled access to the uh, auto grader tests. Um, cool. And then, uh, Question was asked about uh, Jupyter for or installing software in general for future course activities. Um, so yeah, I, I would, if you would like to get Jupyter running on your laptop in time for Wednesday's lecture, I'm gonna have the slides posted or pushed to GitHub just in time for lecture. So you can pull it just before lecture and then you can launch it yourself and uh, revise and edit it. Um, so perhaps I wanna install Jupyter locally if that works out. Uh, I'm not sure we'll have the infrastructure in place for you to have your server access in time for them. So yeah, if you want to do that, you might want to do that locally. Uh, but within a few days, you will have access to the server, in which case you could also run Jupyter from there as well. Uh, so another chat. Um, oh, question about textbooks. So yes, yeah, so, uh, the websites will have a list of references. Uh, I can just talk about them from memory right now. So uh, there's a lot of resources out there, right? So there is books on, believe it or not, there's actually a book on Chisel. Uh, there's books, a lot of books on Scala, a lot of web resources on all these things. But in terms of the books I think are most relevant for this course, there's three books I consider related. Um, number one is a book on Chisel. So this is written by Martin Schrober, uh, and it's a nice little book that kind of covers Chisel. Um, and what's nice about it, this will have a link to it, uh, he's actually put out the whole content for free online, right? So. <laughs> You can buy the book physically. Uh, my copy is in, locked in my office in Santa Cruz. And of course, I'm not on campus right now. It's a solid book. Uh, second edition just came out. And yes, the whole contents are free, available online. Um, 
And the book I recommend is if you really want to get into Scala, which once again, this course is not a Scala course. We're going to kind of teach you just enough Scala just when you need it. But if you really like it, you really want to get into it, there's a lot of resources on Scala. My personal favorite Scala book is written by the Scala creator, Martin Odersky. Uh, and this is, of course, this will also be linked on the webpage for these related recommended books. And yes, this is, you know, your 500 page, you know, super detailed book on a language discussing every feature and every reason why and every intuition and insight and, you know, what it did. Um, so that's something that appeals to you. You should go ahead with that. Uh, also, we're linking some other resources. There's a new book uh, that my TA Jason Lee likes. And that one actually also has a lot of his contents available online. So when we get that, that'll also be linked. Um, so those are kind of like the things that are, you know, very much in scope for this course. One book that I think is extremely relevant, although not technically hard design, is a uh, software engineering book um, by a John Osterhout. And so for those of you unfamiliar with John Osterhout, he's an online professor at Stanford. Uh, he also created the Tickle language, which is for those of your veteran hardware designers, we recognize that's something you may have seen in a lot of hardware design tools. And you may wonder about the lineage or how that happened. Uh, the reason why that happened is actually John Osterhout, years previously in his career, actually helped develop a lot of the early EDA tools, right? He's very responsible for that. And so he's been heavily involved in this process. This particular book I'm hyping up, though, is actually a really good discussion of how to think about your designs. In this case, referring to software, but I think a lot of applies to hardware. And, ways to kind of improve your reuse and have good structure. And it's a really short, really pleasant read. I don't believe the contents are available online, although it is based on a course he's been teaching for years. Uh, but it's a very cheap, small book. Instead, the other uh, related works and references will be kind of linked on the web page. So maybe it's kind of a good segue to um, that. Uh, OK, so sorry, there's another clarification question for chat about what software we need to handle certain things. So for running the. Um, the notebooks, uh, there'll be um, discussion, this instructions posted on the web page about this, right? So regular notebook, you just need Jupyter. In order to run Scala on notebook, you need this thing called Almond, which, you know, I'm going to cast a little shade, uh, isn't as trivial to install as one would like. It's eight lines you copy and paste into your terminal and, you know, trust these people aren't pulling a fast one on you. And if you do those eight lines, you know, or six lines, whatever they are, uh, it's going to install Almond and all of a sudden, magically, your notebooks can now do Scala. Um, yeah, I don't like that. I like having everything in the package manager controlled, but you know, it gets the job done. Um, if that's too stressful or something you don't want to do, then hopefully we'll get you access to the server, in which case you can take advantage of our uh, Jupyter install, which has got Scala support. Um, so maybe it's perhaps a good time for me to go advance to this web, uh, page about the web resources, right? So this said, the only way this course is possible is through open source. We're using a lot of open source components. Chisel's open source. A lot of other IPs are open source. And so we really want to give as much as we can away as we can as possible, right? So the sense why I'm making lectures publicly recorded and available, um, lectures themselves will be public, the labs and homework assignments will be public, this link web references instructions is all in a public web page. That'll all be there, right? So this public website, the one you see right now is the like you know one that's for the off season, you know, then the on season web page, which is still being developed and hasn't been pushed publicly yet. So they have a lot more information on it. And that'll be available to communities open the public internet. And most of the time you're happy with that. Uh, for those of you who are enrolled in the course or perhaps in part of the Santa Cruz community in auditing, we also have an internal website on Canvas. This is our uh, institution's way of providing resources to students. We're going to put things here that you know require us to have privacy. So things like you know student grades, uh, as well as links to our Zoom and Slack, which we're not going to put out to the bright internet. Uh, for those students in the course, uh, our community we're trying to develop here, we made a choice to go with Slack for this course. So there's no Piazza. We're going to use Slack for uh, both getting help as well as announcements and question answering um, between myself and my TA Jason. We're hoping between the modest size of this course and you know our activeness, we'll be able to handle the load of responding to Slack conversations and such. But also we encourage students to converse with each other on the Slack. And like I said, for those of you who are already enrolled, um, you should already have access to the Canvas, in which case you should already see the links for both Zooms and the Slacks. For those of you who haven't enrolled yet uh, or auditing, uh, you hopefully, you've already put in contact with me, and I'm going to uh, start sending out both permission codes for those who need to enroll, as well as adding auditors directly to the Canvas. But both these websites kind of in our you know, agile mindset, both being continuously being improved and updated. Like I said it'll be kind of a big delta shift in like probably the next day or so when we push the, uh, you know, deploy the, the public version of the page, which is rather than just being an FAQ, that actually have a little more information to it and links to a lot of this content. Okay, that might help. That's answered a lot of the logistical questions. Let's see how we're doing on time. Oops, wow, we're over time. Um, okay, I'm going to briefly uh, cover the two learning outcomes and then turn off recording. Okay, so 
And I understand if we're over time for you to leave, that's okay, this will be recorded and posted. So for the learning outcomes for this course, uh, I kind of broke them into two categories. There's the very concrete ones, the very mechanical, right? So hopefully after taking this course, you'll be comfortable with Chisel and I guess the byproduct some fraction of Scala. You'll be fine, we're totally comfortable going out and designing some hardware component in Chisel. And not just designing any old hardware component, hopefully you'll be able to create a hardware generator, right? And you can be able to think about certain considerations, like how can I design my generator and make it easy to customize, whether it be functionality users might want different contexts, or even perhaps knobs so users can optimize it for certain situations. And then there's gonna be a lot of, you know, uh, moving parts in terms of, as we go through the design process, especially in some of the later assignments this quarter, we're gonna kind of mix in some of the more modern tools and techniques, such as, you know, we're gonna have, you know, multiple tools being in each other in a tool flow. Uh, we are gonna help you have set up a continuous integration of something you would like. Uh, we're actually gonna have an assignment later on where you're gonna review each other's code and we're gonna play a little bit of verification techniques. And so this is kind of more advanced later on in the quarter, but like I said, we're kind of this constant process of kind of playing around with stuff. And then um, the meta learning objectives, right? What's, what's kind of the takeaways? Even if you aren't gonna be a hard designer, if you're not gonna write chisel, what are you getting out of this course? Um, hopefully, you know, an appreciation and understanding of this agile philosophy, right? Kind of this kind of continuous revision and improvement mindsets. Um, and also as you go through some of these assignments as well as your project, you're gonna have experience going from the initial spark of an idea all the way through development and evolving and then see what happens at the end. And then what it takes to perhaps revise and continue to make it very useful. And hopefully as a result of all this, you'll see opportunities to apply uh, Agile uh, elsewhere in your course or elsewhere in your life, I'm sorry, not, not in the course. And it could be for research and work or it could just be in general, right? You may recognize, oh wait, you know, I need to do this thing, but I know I can't get it right the first time. So I better, you know, figure out a way to get something kind of going and then kind of iteratively improve. Okay, I'm gonna leave the sharing on, but I'm gonna stop recording and stay.